Good day. I am Patricia McCarter, Administrative Support Officer for the Office of the Privacy Commissioner for Bermuda. Our next panel is Indigenous Perspectives on Privacy and will be moderated by Mr. Michael McEvoy. The panel will examine different perspectives on privacy and data protection. Without further ado, Mr. McEvoy, please begin when you are ready. Well, good morning, and as, as my colleague Trevor uh, uh, said in the last uh, session, uh, there's a little bit of room up front if you're crowded back there. Please, uh, please feel free to come to the front. My name is Michael McAvoy. I'm the Information and Privacy Commissioner uh, for British Columbia in uh, Canada. Uh, we are also serve our office as the uh, Secretariat for the Asia Pacific Privacy Authorities uh, on, a, on a global stage. I should begin by saying that uh, my great grandparents and grandparents emigrated to Canada from the Ukraine and in Ireland in the late 1800s and the uh, 1920s, all of which is to say that uh, my roots in what is now called Canada are very recent, and uh, I am not an Indigenous person. Um, I say that uh, out loud because uh, in ask, being asked to do this panel uh, by Alex, I approach it as I think all of us do with some degree of, uh, of humility. It's a very important topic for those of us uh, with Indigenous people within our jurisdictions and um, as well as uh, uh, posing legal and moral uh, challenges as well. Uh, to help in that discussion this morning, I am joined by um, uh, Gihan Gunasekra, who is an associate professor in commercial law at the University of Auckland, to, sitting two over from me. He's currently researching the implications of data sovereignty from its economic, technological, and indigenous standpoints. Uh, Mercy King Ore, who is a policy analyst from the Global Privacy Team with the Future Privacy Forum based in Kenya. And uh, finally, but not least, my friend and colleague, uh, Josefina Roman uh, Vergara, Commissioner from the INI in Mexico. So thank you for being with us. We thought it was um, uh, a good idea maybe to do this panel a little bit differently than uh, most panels. Um, we want to, the voices of Indigenous people globally are obviously varied, as are views of privacy generally around the world. But we thought it was as good to include as many voices, at least to scratch the surface of Indigenous voices uh, globally as we could. So in this panel, you will see uh, perhaps a few more uh, uh, presentations on the screen than you normally would. They're not lengthy but they kind of give a bit of an insight into the topic, I think, that can help uh, guide us in that respect. So the first uh, video that we wanted to share with you uh, is uh, uh, from Dr. Uh, Tahu Kukitai, who's at the University of Wakato in New Zealand. Um, a, a number of the, the people you'll see presenting would very much have liked to have been here, actually, to join us, but for resource and other uh, reasons could not do so. So uh, Dr. Kukatai will give us a bit of an overview of uh, issues from perspective in, in her um, uh, environs. And uh, so perhaps if we could uh, play that uh, video now. Yoda, greetings. My name is Tahu Kukutai. I am Professor of Demography at the University of Waikato. I hail from the Ngāti Tipa, Ngāti Kinohaku and Te Opori tribes, and I'm a founding member of the Māori Data Sovereignty Network. So I'm just going to start my slideshow. So today I want to talk about Indigenous and particularly Māori perspectives on privacy, Drawing on research from the Tikanga and Technology Project at the University of Waikato and the URL is at the bottom of the slide. As you all well know, data privacy regulation focuses on the protection of personal data and personal data privacy. However, the Western emphasis on the atomistic individual contrasts with other traditions that see humans as relational beings whose identity and reality turns on their relationship with others. And this relational paradigm has implications for how we think about data and data privacy. When our team began developing the Māori data privacy framework, we were interested to see if we could identify some shared features of Indigenous concepts of privacy. And what we found 
was this. Indigenous concepts of privacy are inherently collective and are underpinned by Indigenous laws and protocols that determine when, how and by whom information and knowledge can or should be shared. Indigenous collectives have the right to own and control information collectively in much the same way that an individual owns and controls her personal information. Where an individual's information is intermingled with others, one obvious example being ancestry and genetic data, then there is a collective privacy right in recognising and upholding relationships of belonging and responsibility and respect are paramount. So for Indigenous peoples, the protection of personal data is just one part of a much wider set of data privacy considerations. So in recent years, Indigenous groups have developed their own data protection technologies to push back against data colonialism and to try and give their communities some sense of control over their information. A recent article shown here in Scientific American discusses some of these initiatives. One of them on the right hand side is a Māori tech business called Aho, which is a free open source app developed for Māori to record ancestry data, maintain uh, tribal registries and share cultural narratives. And all of the information is encrypted on the user's device or to their own kinship group. So I want to give a brief snapshot of the Māori data privacy framework that our team has been working on. Despite there being no word for privacy in the Māori language, there are well-defined protocols or tikanga that are central to a Māori concept of privacy and that operate together to bring balance and order and to provide guidance when transgressed. So this is a visual of the core elements without all the detail that sits underneath. Uh, we begin with our atua or gods, Rangi Nui at the top, Sky Father, and Papatua Nuku at the bottom, Earth Mother. They protect the sanctity of our natural, social, and material worlds. Atua are our foundation, providing an enduring narrative of good spirit, connection, and identity for current and future generations. Atua remind us that data and uh, data technologies are human creations that entail responsibilities and accountabilities. Whakapapa is at the centre of the framework. This refers to the genealogical layering and sequencing of relationships of all living things, from our founding ancestors to our digital versions of ourselves. Data are literally our relations. All data come from somewhere and someone. All individuals are part of a collective, whether they know it or not. And the collective is always more than a sum of its parts. We have four tikanga values that form the pillars of Māori data privacy. The first is mana. To hold mana is to hold binding authority or power over one's domain, including digital domains. Mana can be held by individuals and groups. Uh, for Māori, having mana in a digital environment means that we should be able to make decisions about how our personal and collective information is collected stored, accessed, deleted, shared and used, including secondary uses. Uh, tapu is an essential element of a Māori privacy concept. Tapu defines what is special or restricted in the context of data. Tapu safeguards and upholds issues of data restrictions and sensitivity. This means that data that comes from Māori individuals or groups may still require restrictions in terms of how it is shared and used, even if it is de-identified. This also means, for example, that we should have the right to know if our data are being used to develop or train machines or algorithms and the right to opt out. Modi uh, at the bottom is the force of all life. Modi requires privacy laws and standards that protect Māori data as a taonga, a precious resource of tangible and intangible value. And finally, ho is a vital essence of life that is shared by all living things. In digital worlds, ho symbolises a state of balance based on a moral code of reciprocity. Ho requires privacy, laws and standards that protect the qualities of equity and justice. Before I close, I would like to acknowledge our Council of Elders, our Kahui Matua, who worked with us on the framework shown here, uh, their hope is for a privacy paradigm that protects all of the digital lives of their grandchildren, now and yet to come, one that is grounded in a more holistic and relational practice of informational self-determination. <laughs>
Thank you. So uh, we would all like to thank Dr. Kukatai for uh, uh, providing that specific uh, presentation for all of us uh, here today on a global stage. Uh, she raises a number of important uh, themes and uh, principles. And one of those, I think, uh, that stands out, I think, is the, is the notion of uh, privacy being a collective right as opposed to an individual right in Indigenous uh, cultures. That's a, a, a question and an issue uh, in Canada where I come from. Uh, my colleague, uh, Patricia Kassim, who, uh, Commissioner Kassim from Ontario is here, uh, who uh, does a, a podcast, by the way, which I would uh, strongly commend to you, uh, put this question about collective rights of, of privacy and whether Indigenous people perhaps view privacy somewhat differently than our <laughs> current legislative framework. She put that question to Jonathan Dewar, who is the First Nations Information uh, Governance Center uh, representative, and um, he was asked that question, and here, uh, here is the answer that uh, uh, pa Patricia Kasim, uh, Commissioner Kasim, received. And speaking of our office, of course, as the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario, I'm curious to know why privacy isn't mentioned as one of the OCAP principles. Was it not considered as important 25 years ago when these principles were developed, or do First Nations just have a different conception of privacy? Jonathan, what's, what's the reason why privacy doesn't feature in your OCAP principles? Yeah, it's a good question. Canadian law really falls down on this issue for First Nations because the focus is on the individual and not the collective. First Nations have a collective right to privacy, but where is the Canadian law that supports that? Well, it doesn't exist. First Nations, from time immemorial, have had concepts of privacy. They've had First Nations laws now, these would, of course, be in original languages, not using the word, the English word, privacy. But that exists, and that knowledge is in communities, it's in First Nations. And so that has always been there. The problem has been Canadian law essentially overshadowing First Nations law. It's that imbalance of power that we talked about. And that's one of the things that we have to rectify within our work toward reconciliation, whatever that is. Canada and First Nations, if they're truly in nation-to-nation -nation relationships need to reconcile that. And so what can Canadian law do alongside First Nations law? First Nations law being the more ideal place to articulate what it means for the collective to have a right to privacy. So could there be a second P on OCAP? That's an interesting thought. Uh, we will certainly take that back into the collective conversation that we have. But I think there's a great deal of work that needs to be done within First Nations and with Canada to work through those issues. But the simple fact of the matter is, yes, First Nations have their own thinking on their own concepts of privacy and Canadian law is insufficient. And do you think Canadian privacy laws should evolve to include this collective notion of privacy or group notion of privacy? Well, I'd go further than should and say it has to evolve. Canada can never achieve a harmonious nation-to-nation -nation relationship with First Nations without So thank you for that uh, contribution, uh, uh, Commissioner Kasim and, and your guest. And I want to turn to uh, Mercy on our panel, thinking about um, privacy as a collective uh, notion, how that resonates uh, uh, in Kenya and, and in Africa. Yeah, so I think this, the last video really encapsulates what privacy and collective privacy looks like, even in Africa. And what really is at the core of collective privacy is the communal way of living of communities, okay? So what they, so what indigenous communities are requesting or they're asking um, data protection regulations to have is to cover these aspects of communal living and what ideally is communal ways of living because it in itself has its own features. It's a consultative process. It's a process that involves taking into consideration the sensitivities of what is particular to them. And I'm sure um, during, as we proceed, there will be a discussion on what the sensitivities are. But ideally, collective privacy, and that's why it's sort of an, in a very big way different from individual forms of privacy. And as was mentioned here, is because of these nuances that communities um, carry and um, the values that they have, um, especially the issue of values, uh, because these values are shared among so many people, they now are expecting that these values could be transplanted in data protection laws. 
Thanks for that. And um, Gihan, from your studies in uh, New Zealand and, and looking at these issues, uh, uh, what uh, resonates uh, with you about this? Well, I'd like to, uh, to reflect, the, echo those uh, sentiments that, uh, that your uh, speaker uh, in the podcast um, mentioned. Uh, and I, I don't know how things are in Canada, but in, in certainly in New Zealand, um, indigenous resources, if you think of land and water and other resources in New Zealand, uh, the uh, Maori people um, generally, those resources are, are held collectively and decisions about them are made collectively. Um, so there's no reason to think that data would be, would be any different. Um, so the, the important thing is decision making is not made by the individual. It's, it's, it's a collective in which, of course, the individual would participate. Um, the other point I would make is that uh, mainstream, I mean, we've heard a lot at this um, conference about groups of collectives of people um, and the importance of collective, uh, which is uh, groups acting together to protect their information, which is not something that mainstream privacy laws cover. Um, but of course, indigenous people have been doing this all along. So you, we could argue that um, really uh, privacy is, is a newcomer to this, and indigenous people have long since had the, the answer to this. Uh, scholars such as Fla Floridi, Luciana Floridi, and others have argued for group privacy rights uh, and for collective action uh, in regard to da uh, data privacy. Um, and that autonomy can be only uh, exercised in this way, not, not at the individual level. Um, finally, in New Zealand, we have uh, groups such as Temana Raronga, which is a uh, New Zealand um, the uh, Maori Data Sovereignty Network, and they have put out several very good publications and uh, their website contains a set of principles for, for Maori data sovereignty. Um, and that re re talks about the importance of acting collectively, but it also contains a formula for how to reconcile conflicts within the collective and resorting to indigenous values that um, have a formula for how to balance where there's a tension which can arise from time to time uh, those values have, they're already, they're, it's, a, it's an alternative value system uh, drawing on, on concepts such as Fananga Tanga and, and Rangitiri Tanga and so on. Uh, but we have, we have ways of dealing with that. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. And um, a couple of, the, one of the things you're talking about in terms of collective uh, uh, rights, uh, it means exerting some control and ownership uh, about how information is shared and distributed and collected in indigenous uh, societies and how our own legal regimes interact with that. That's really a fundamentally important issue which I think has arisen in a number of jurisdictions uh, globally. And um, I, I, we just want to share with you a, a Canadian video, but I think it, it, it sort of deals with issues that have broader implications beyond Canada. So this is from the Canadian First Nations Information Governance Centre to help explain a little bit briefly about the issue of control and ownership of, of data. For millennia, First Nations ways of living, knowing and being were protected. Our languages, our identities and our sovereignty thrived. We were safe, we were strong. But with colonization, our sovereignty and the right to determine our own futures came under threat. Control and ownership over our ways of knowing and being began to break down, creating a void between who we are today and who the Creator intended us to be. Yet despite these hardships, we are a strong and resilient peoples with a proud history and an even brighter future. In this era of reconciliation, a new story is being written. This story sees us taking back what is ours. It sees us exercising our rights to self-determination and self-government. But to do this, we must also exercise our rights over our information, over our knowledge, over our data. In a rapidly evolving digital economy, data in the form of information, statistics and research is key. To date, Canada has been and is still collecting our data, comparing our quality of life, and planning our futures without our input or consent. We have been forced to fit into a mold that is not of our making or of our choosing. So we are at a loss for reliable, relevant data that speaks for us from our worldview. Our data must belong to us.
And so um, for indigenous people, as I've learned a lot through the work that I've done as commissioner, this is not, uh, this is more than an academic exercise. There are, uh, history is replete with examples of data being collected from indigenous peoples and being used in ways that uh, were never um, either consented to or expected. Uh, the place where I live in Victoria, uh, BC on Vancouver Island, um, a number of years ago, blood samples were taken from the Nechalnik people um, with their consent, with a view to looking at genetic data around uh, arth arthritic conditions that seem to, be, seem to have been inherited. So they wanted to study that, a very good thing to do. Uh, what later transpired, they found out there was no genetic link, but the information from those samples was reused, I think, at least seven or eight times for other purposes without asking any uh, uh, consent. So obviously raising issues of, uh, of control that, uh, again, there are many instances and other examples of this. That is just uh, one of them. So in terms of, um, in terms of the ownership and control issue and thinking about this in, in terms of uh, uh, regimes globally, I, I want to come back to, to Gihan and ask uh, uh, for your thoughts on, on that issue. Uh, uh, thanks, Commissioner. Um, I, I'm also somewhat humbled uh, by some of these, uh, your contributors. Uh, and I should add that I'm not an Indigenous person, at least I'm not Indigenous to New, to New Zealand. <laughs> Uh, my family uh, emigrated from Sri Lanka to New Zealand when I was very young, so I've spent my pretty much my whole life in New Zealand, but I'm not of indigenous ancestry. Um, but I, I'm encouraged to hear the sentiments uh, by the various indigenous um, speakers and contributors. Um, we have in New Zealand, the issue of control is, is, is paramount. Um, the the Temana Raronga that I referred to, the Maori Data Sovereignty has, the network has put out um, its uh, ideals and goals. And uh, these are challenging to, to those of us who are information privacy uh, scholars and, and practitioners because they, uh, they suggest that even information that is not PI, not personal information, where the identi identifiers have been stripped out and it's anonymized and perhaps aggregated with other data sets, those should also be still subject to some control from the, the people whose data it was originally collected from. Uh, to the extent that the, the indigenous people should still have a right to retrieve that data, even, even once it's been de-identified, uh, even from aggregated and anonymized data sets. And um, we, there's also a very recent paper put out by, we heard earlier from my, um, uh, uh, from my colleague, um, Tahu Kukotai. Um, now, she, uh, she is at the University of Waikato, and they have recently put out a paper on Maori data sovereignty and privacy specifically. Um, and in that paper, they make the point that um, there should perhaps be a right to block uh, the use of data, where data is, is being used to reveal sensitive things about the, the Maori people and, and, and uh, perhaps reveal aspects of their culture and um, where there are particular sensitivities. Uh, there should be an ability to block or, or perhaps have that data removed in the same way that GDPR allows you to, to erase data or perhaps a right to object. So that raises um, some interesting um, issues. Um, the other thing that's come out of, our, uh, come out of uh, some of these writings is that the scholars have suggested that they're not asked after the information just for its own sake, not to control the information just for its own sake, but the data should be used for good. And so in other words, to turn the Google formula, do, do no evil, uh, to turn that around and saying, make sure you do good with data. In other words, data is useless unless you actually do something beneficial with it. So research for its own sake is discouraged, at least in the, amongst the Maori <laughs> networks that I have, I have um, associated with. Um, and then a good example of how this formula has been implemented in New Zealand law is the Kaitiaki regulations of 1995. This deals with, uh, we have a, a national cancer cervical uh, screening uh, system in New Zealand um, where, where everyone is screened and, and that data goes into a huge, uh, once it's been obviously um, collected, it gets de-identified and it goes into a huge database which is very valuable for researchers to research the, the incidence and prevalence of cervical cancer. But uh, whereas the, the Maori data is concerned, even though the identity of the people is, are not known, the fact that they are Maori is retained uh, and, and any data involving people of Maori descent uh, 
need to be obtained through the, this guardianship council that uh, it, it has, the, has the power to veto any research that they don't think will be beneficial. So that's an example. And um, more recently in New Zealand, we have had struggles for control over uh, COVID-19 data. In the, in the height of the pandemic, the Maori population was lagging 20, about 22% behind the general population in vaccination rates. And there was a huge deficit there. And uh, Maori health providers were very effective in reaching out to their communities. And they said to the government, the Ministry of Health, give us the names and addresses of those people who are not vaccinated. And um, the government said, no, privacy, we can't give you that information. Uh, so the, the Maori organization took the government to court. And there were a couple of cases, high profile cases. And in both of those cases, uh, they were successfully challenged the government uh, that was forced to reconsider its decision. Uh, one of the claims the government made was that Maori themselves had sovereignty in the data. And this would offend the tribes, the iwi, who would, who would argue that's their data, so data sovereignty. So the Crown used that as a defense. But that was struck down because the court found, got expert, uh, expert witnesses from within the Maori community that basically said uh, where there is a tension there, the, and, and this Maori organization, by the way, was administering uh, vaccines to the entire Maori population, irrespective of their tribal affiliation. So they, they didn't care which iwi and, and, and so on uh, might claim. On, and there was no time to get consent from all the iwi, because by that stage, everyone would have got COVID. So time was of the essence. Um, and the court agreed, and the expert, expert witnesses said that the Maori values that were applied in that case were whanaunga tanga, respectful relationships, uh, which has also been referred to by Justice Joe Williams of our Supreme Court. He's a judge of Maori descent. He's described Fananga Tanga as the underpinning principle of the first law of, of Aotearoa New Zealand. Uh, and Rangitiri Tanga, those people in leadership positions within the Maori community had a duty to, to protect the health and well-being of their community. And to claim that any one iwi had ownership of the data, the court rejected that. The expert witnesses said, yes, data is a taonga, something of value, uh, but the life and health of the community has a higher status. Uh, and so this is interesting because the Maori values uh, a principle structure was used to basically reconcile intra-Maori arguments as to who should have uh, access to the data. So, that, yeah. so that's, these are some of the battles that have been uh, fought and I think overcome in New Zealand. Thanks, uh, thanks for that, Gihan. And, and Mercy, from uh, your perspective uh, in Kenya and uh, Africa, what, what observations would you have to offer? Yeah, so... Um, I think the issue of ownership and control still is rife in, in Kenya and also uh, speaking generally for Africa because, um, and as we're going to show, like uh, indigenous communities are, do, do form a huge uh, part of the continent. But I think it's very important to note that the state of indigenous communities and just listening to what uh, Gerhan, Dr. Professor Gerhan is saying is that compared to what is happening in, in, um, in Australia, the, marginal, um, the indigenous communities in Africa do suffer from inter intersectional problems because what you find is that in, um, indigenous communities also do experience a lot of marginalization. They are yet to, um, to really um, be seen fully. Um, so we are not seeing things like the Maori Data Sovereignty Network. And there is still a lot to be done. And because of all of this, what we are seeing is that um, even when their data is collected, what we observe is that their data is mostly, there is a context within which their data is used. Most of it is either for aid, um, for research, as you mentioned with the blood sample, um, it's also happening um, in the continent. Um, and what this does is that most of these data uses tend to fall um, outside the um, exemptions of data, uh, data protection laws. Uh, and therefore exposes them a lot to um, issues of data protection. And therefore there's been, um, and also it's important that to, to mention that this also causes them to like relieve uh, ownership and control of these forms of data. And what we're also seeing um, that's raising ownership and control issues is how we're also, how indigenous communities who are now living among um, what I term the rest of the communities is, so there is, at, uh, there is the use of, um, personal of, of data away from 
what I'd call um, typical uses of data among indigenous communities, which is, as I said, like aid. And so what is happening in indigenous communities, at least in Africa, are now also accessing the internet, um, like any other person, and they are using these um, uh, technologies, and their data is being processed in these systems. So what this also raises is, again, other issues of ownership and control. And now they find themselves in the data protection ecosystem, and they, their challenges compound again because there's the issue of literacy, okay? Um, so we're seeing a lot of uh, lack, they, they really don't, I can't say they've really uh, gotten a hold of proper how to control their data compared to what I'm hearing from, from Professor Gerhan. So these are the risks that we are seeing among um, African indigenous communities. Yeah, and to further pick up on that theme, we invited uh, a colleague, uh, Grace Matanga from, uh, from Africa to uh, just briefly expand on this. And uh, so if we just uh, could have that uh, brief uh, video, um, that would be great. Good day from wherever you are. My name is Grace Mutungu. I am a technology policy researcher based in Africa. And I have observed the development of data protection technology uh, laws in the past uh, 15 years. And um, this is what I'd say about indigenous people and data. The first is a definitional issue where I would argue that um, in Africa, most of the people are indigenous. Um, you find that um, majority of the population in the continent have been there for five, six, ten generations, and therefore they are indigenous to the continent um, because they have been there in the recent past. However, there are also levels uh, to indigeneity and um, because um, citizenship um, is a political process in most countries, uh, various groups um, uh, face uh, uh, various uh, issues and these issues are also uh, um, coming out in the digital economy. For example, um, we have seen cases of uh, people going to court because they have uh, been denied an opportunity to participate in the digital economy, for example, by being excluded from uh, uh, national digital identification um, programs. Um, and so there are levels to indigeneity. Um, the second point I'd like to make is um, the way uh, policy making and the laws um, have not been indigenous. Um, we have uh, transplanted laws from other places. Um, one of the laws that um, is most adopted in African countries, uh, for example, in the data protection um, regime is GDPR. Um, and while it is a good law and it has uh, its advantages, there are also some nuances um, that are missed uh, when such laws are brought um, into the continent, an example that is relevant for indigenous um, uh, people and their data is the issue of collective rights, um, whereby um, GDPR kind of laws tend to require that um, for a complaint to be made, it has to be made by an individual. In practice, uh, indigenous communities have uh, collective representation, collective ways of making decisions, and collective ways. There had to be a technical issue at some point in this uh, production. I don't know if we're able to, uh, um, well, let's, uh, I, I would just continue on to say, I know one of the, the points that uh, Grace uh, uh, is making is that the uh, uh, the challenges, and she actually challenges regulators to think about these issues in terms of how we engage with indigenous communities um, in terms of their wanting, we as regulators often get individual complaints, but there's collective elements to this. Um, there are a whole range of issues, uh, various indigenous communities that differ. I know in Mexico, uh, Josefina, this is something that you have had to think very deeply about uh, as in, at the NI because of the range of indigenous communities and how the NI interacts with indigenous communities and, and the law. And I, I wonder if you could share that with us in some of your experience. Gracias. 
Muy buenos días, gracias Michael. Yo quiero darles antes de iniciar algunos datos que me parecen muy interesantes. Miren, en la mayoría de los países eh, los alumnos que reciben educación y es básica la primaria reciben la educación en una lengua materna diferente. El 40% de la población mundial no tiene acceso a una educación en la lengua que habla. Pero en el caso de México, ¿qué pasa? En México tenemos más de 2.450 municipios. De 23.2 millones de mexicanos que somos, se autoidentifican como indígenas el 30.8% 30 de la población. En México se hablan 68 lenguas indígenas. Y un dato que hay que tomar en cuenta es que de cada 100 personas, 12 personas, además de que hablan una lengua indígena, no hablan español. Entonces, el hecho de recibir la educación básica en una lengua que no hablan, pues evidentemente ese es de los más graves problemas que tenemos. Eh, en México, a partir de 2001, realizamos una reforma a la Constitución, la Constitución Política de los Estados Unidos Mexicanos, y en donde se reconoce como un derecho fundamental eh, la libre autodeterminación de los pueblos originarios. En este artículo 2 constitucional, evidentemente se reconoce en principio que la composición pluricultural de México está sustentada justamente en sus pueblos originarios. Se reconocen derechos fundamentales y para efectos de esta materia, lo más importante que hay que decir es que este artículo 2 constitucional reconoce el derecho a la auto determinación, de hecho dice libre determinación, además de por supuesto autonomía para decidir sobre formas internas de convivencia, organización social, económica, política. Uno de los ejemplos más importantes que yo quería mencionar este día es que una de las 32 entidades federativas que tenemos en México, seguramente alguna vez habrán escuchado en el sur del país, está el estado de Oaxaca. Oaxaca tiene 570 municipios y de esos 570 municipios, 417 corresponden a usos y costumbres. Esto significa que los pueblos originarios en México tienen la posibilidad de eh, esa autodeterminación informativa. Como ya está en el artículo segundo, esta eh, autonomía, entre comillas, que tienen los pueblos originarios, la legislación en materia de protección de datos personales en México la diferenciamos, por un lado, la ley general que aplica a instituciones públicas, incluyendo a todas las entidades federales, estatales y municipales, y la ley de protección de datos que aplica a todos los particulares. Los pueblos originarios, por este artículo 2, tienen la posibilidad de eh, tomar sus propias decisiones políticas, económicas, administrativas, pero el ejercicio de los derechos contemplados en la legislación mexicana lo ejercen como todo mexicano. Un ejemplo interesante es eh, una definición que la Ley de Transparencia en México dice como ajustes razonables. Nos ha tocado en muchas ocasiones en donde una persona que habla maya, es la lengua más hablada en México y algunos países de Centroamérica, hace una solicitud de acceso a información en lengua maya y las autoridades tenemos obligación de hacer la respuesta en lengua maya. Desde el INAI les comparto que, por ejemplo, dentro del presupuesto tenemos un apartado especial para realizar respuestas, resolver eh, quejas, recursos en la lengua originaria de la persona que hace una solicitud.
Lo mismo aplicaría para el ejercicio de derechos de acceso, rectificación, cancelación y oposición en el tema de datos personales. Y bueno, solo para finalizar, otro ejemplo muy interesante que hay, sobre todo en el sur del país, donde de estas 68 lenguas originarias que se hablan en México, cinco son los que mayormente eh, hablan mexicanos y mexicanas. De estas hay ejercicios muy interesantes, como en el estado de Chiapas, en donde una universidad eh, multicultural enseña hasta el nivel eh, superior hasta el nivel de universidad en diferentes lenguas originarias, además del español. Entonces, esta universidad inclusive llega a dar apoyo a diferentes instituciones públicas para que intérpretes certificados puedan hacer estas respuestas tanto en materia de acceso a información pública para la mejor toma de decisiones de pueblos originarios como en materia del ejercicio de sus derechos en materia de protección de datos personales. Gracias, Michael. Gracias. I'm sure by all, by now, one has a sense of the, the, the global uh, nature of these uh, issues and themes. Um, and in fact, it's an issue that's been addressed by the United Nations and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, I should say, uh, parenthetically, in British Columbia, our legislature has uh, adopted um, that uh, uh, United Nations Declaration, which has considerable legal uh, implications for the work that uh, we do as a regulator. So I thought it was uh, probably just to spend a moment and ask Ehan if he can just remind us of some of the key elements of that the United Nations Declaration and how that will absolutely impact uh, uh, matters globally. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I, just uh, before um, doing that, I should say uh, I'm very heartened to hear from the Commissioner that um, there are universities uh, in, in her country that uh, uh, people can study in their indigenous languages. Uh, we also have a university in New Zealand, a national university, uh, where um, uh, the, the Tereo is the language of, of our Maori people, and they, uh, they can undertake study. Um, and I'm increasingly challenged at the University of Auckland by students who enroll and um, demand to do their assi assessments in, in Tereo. So um, we can't always comply, but uh, we're, we're trying our best. So. Um, it's an increasing global trend. Um, but the question was regarding the United Nations, and I think that's a really good um, uh, perspective to consider because um, the United Nations gives legitimacy, I, I guess, to the indigenous rights movement. Um, there is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, UNDRIP, uh, which was signed, I think, uh, quite some years ago, around 2007, I believe. And, and New Zealand and Australia and Canada, and I think the United States have all um, acceded to that um, in New Zealand with some reluctance initially. Um, uh, but um, it's a non-binding non declaration, but it, it has moral standing. Uh, and it has a number of articles that I think indigenous people can look to. Um, one of them is, uh, that I've picked out is Article 33. Indigenous people have the right to determine their own identity in accordance with their values and customs. So, you know, identity is something that is sometimes arbitrarily assigned by, by governments and uh, other um, organizations to decide if somebody is, has got a legitimate valid identity. Well, in, indigenous people have the right to determine their own identity according to their own values. And Article 35 talks about the individual's responsibilities to their community, to the community that they belong to. So in other words, there's a reciprocity here. Uh, and this comes back to, in New Zealand, the, the value of whanaunga tanga. It's, it's a two-way uh, interchange. It's not just the individual saying, I have rights against everyone. I, the individual must also uh, have obligations to their community. Now, the United Nations uh, special, the previous, uh, I know the current special rapporteur is, is attending this event, um, but uh, her predecessor, um, Joe Kanatachi, who I was very lucky to, uh, to meet when he visited New Zealand some years ago, uh, has issued several reports, and one of them is spe specifically on indigenous data sovereignty, and uh, uses the U United Nations uh, principles uh, from the UNDRIP uh, declaration as the legitimizing grounds for that. But the special rapporteur has said there are two, two things to really consider. The first is the principle of indigenous data sovereignty. So that's the overarching sort of uh, 
principle that gives value to indigenous people's rights. But on, underneath that, there is uh, the need for indigenous data governance. So that's at the practical level. How do we implement that principle of indigenous data um, sovereignty in practice? And he has suggested that the only way to do that is through in, uh, indigenous data governance, where the rules themselves are promulgated by indigenous peoples. The leadership uh, in, in that regard is also within indigenous communities. And those leaders are then held accountable according to those same values. So in other words, it's got to be uh, in, it's got to be homegrown, it's got to be organic, and not, in, not something imposed by a colonial kind of uh, imposition. So that's what really self-determination in, in the data space means, uh, according to the Special Rapporteur. And, and, and those reports are certainly worth reading. Uh, the Special Rapporteur didn't sit behind a desk and draft that report. He went all around the world. He went to the most remote communities in, you know, in the middle of Australia and, and so on. Uh, spoke to people on the ground, uh, and it, it's really worth uh, reading that report. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gihan. Um, in terms of the, uh, the work we've done as panelists in thinking about these issues, uh, um, I wanted to ask our panelists uh, uh, just what uh, messages, what lessons we've kind of thought about and learned. I, I, I just reflect on some of my own thoughts as, as, uh, uh, as, as a regulator and thinking through some of these issues, and particularly those of us in North America who go to these sessions uh, frequently, and probably not just in North America, but other places. The beginning of privacy generally starts with the Brandeis and Warren a picture from the Harvard Law Review in 1890, and if you want to bring it a little more up to date, the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights in 1948, and if you really want to get modern, the OECD principles. Uh, in, in, in 1980, but I have to say, I, reflecting myself, um, I have to say that, that, that view is, uh, to be fair to myself, somewhat ignorant of history and somewhat ignorant of the traditions that have long predated uh, the, the evolution of what's happened uh, to us in North American society. I also I think as we struggle, uh, not just as regulators, but as a society, thinking about issues that we'd previously thought about as individual transactions giving over your driver's license to get a certain thing and a complaint being lodged now into the world of AI where the implications are so much societal as opposed to individual. How do we grapple with that? How is that written into the work we do as, as regulators? I think there's a lot of wisdom to be found uh, amongst our indigenous peoples in our respective jurisdictions about some of those issues. Those were some of my thoughts. Mercy, uh, mm -hmm. from your perspective and work, what, uh, what are your parting thoughts uh, in thinking and considering these issues? Yeah, so I think you correctly said that, that you know, the initial definition of privacy as we get understand it um, from Warren and Brandeis definitely has its own limitations. But I think there's also, there's, that's also an opportunity for us because as we all know, the right to privacy, our privacy in itself is still not defined. So more than being problematic, that offers an opportunity for us to you know, reimagine privacy. There's an opportunity for us to stretch it and reshape the idea of privacy, how to cater for um, indigenous communities and their, and their needs and values, as Professor Gehan has um, highlighted them. And also paying attention um, in considering the rights of indigenous communities, the right to privacy, it's very important, at least from where I come from, to consider what the impact of the levels that, of indigeneity that Grace tried to raise on the impact of privacy on communities. And I say this because from my stand, levels of indigeneity really impact how I enjoy privacy and how someone of, a, of, a, of an indigenous nature yet marginalized enjoys privacy, okay? Uh, because from, uh, for those that are, suffer of also marginalization, the opportunities for them to come together and form forms, um, things like my, uh, data sovereignty networks still is impossible, okay? So uh, levels of indigeneity are very important when considering the right to privacy. And I think also uh, one of the things that indigenous communities um, and privacy offers us is it really allows us to have those moments of, yes, we know we can use this data, but should we, okay? And also, um, it's very important for, uh, for us when dealing with indigenous communities and privacy to seek them out. Because what happens is, and again, I just speak from where I come from, is 
um, the levels of awareness of you know, even these forms of data collection is still low. So we might talk about them enforcing their rights, but awareness of these rights, is it even there? So I think um, that would be my parting shot, um, just to consider all these four issues when dealing with indigenous communities, uh, right, their right to privacy and data protection. Yeah, that's such a, an important point about reaching out, and uh, it's something that I think uh, many of us, I know in Canada, think about reaching out to uh, communities and taking the initiative to do that, which is really important. Um, Gihan, did you have any uh, concluding thoughts? Yes, I'm also very intrigued by what Mercy said about, uh, uh, I mean, the, these are issues that are, I'm sure, um, present in other countries, uh, equity, the access to to technology, um, uh, sort of literacy. I mean, these basic things we take for granted. Um, and, and where there's social um, and economic deprivation, then you know, rights are of less meaning because people don't, don't, don't have the ability to exercise those rights. So I, I completely agree with you, uh, Mercy, as, as far as that aspect goes. Um, just in terms of some parting thoughts, um, I think it's, um, it's interesting when we look at indigenous perspectives and the research and the literature, um, it suggests that there's a similar track here to the tensions that indigenous people have experienced with, with intellectual property, uh, exercising intellectual property rights. Because it, the traditional categories of intellectual property um, don't cater well to indigenous knowledge. And that's been a global problem in, in New Zealand as well as in other jurisdictions. Uh, it just doesn't fit the existing sort of IT, the information, uh, sorry, the uh, intellectual property categories of copyright, patent, and, and so on. Um, and and so I think we're going to see similar pressure on the prevailing notions of information privacy. What is personally identifiable information? What is PI? Um, quantified data does not necessarily recognize what indigenous people refer to as the other ways of knowing. You know, there are other ways of knowing than quantified data. Uh, one of the things I, I would like to end with is to, is to talk about the connection between people, places, and things. So the Māori talk about, uh, Atahu I talked about that in her presentation earlier today, but there is, uh, there's a link between individuals, the places they come from, and the objects and, and things that they hold of value. Now, of course, we live now in the Internet of Things, where, where things are connected, but perhaps indigenous people knew that all along because they, there has always been this connection between objects, things, and places, and, and, and individuals. Uh, and in the Maori world, and I'm sure it is the same in other indigenous cultures, there is a spiritual element as well, the metaphysical. Uh, there is something that we cannot, we cannot explain. And if you think about um, some of the things that now data scientists are discovering with big data, um, we, we, we can't explain it, but we know it exists. Now, indigenous people have always known that. Uh, and that's perhaps some, with, with some sense of humility, perhaps we should um, recognize that. So I think in, 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 in my parting thoughts, I would say that's something to think about. Yeah, thanks for that. Josefina. Bien. Yo, yo quisiera dejar sobre la mesa el tema de que en México la Constitución establece como derecho fundamental ya eh, la libertad de los pueblos originarios para regirse por usos y costumbres. Sin embargo, la legislación en materia de protección de datos, tanto para instituciones públicas como para privados, les otorga el mismo derecho a los más de 23.2 millones de mexicanos que somos de la misma manera. Me parece que una muy importante diferencia para ejercer eh, en la práctica el derecho a la privacidad y el derecho a la protección de los datos personales eh, es un poco los sistemas de educación que debieran ser completamente inclusivos. Es alarmante el dato de que de las personas que hablan una lengua originaria de cada 112 solo hablan español y no reciben una educación básica en la lengua originaria que hablan, pues difícilmente alguien ejerce un derecho que no lo conoce. Entonces, me parece que el punto que, que yo quisiera dejar sobre la mesa es este, que los sistemas de educación sean absolutamente inclusivos. Y también tomar en cuenta 
que si una persona busca ejercer sus derechos o eh, obligar a que aquellas personas públicas o privadas que hagan tratamiento de datos personales bajo cualquier argumento o finalidad, cumplan estrictamente con lo que la legislación establece en principios, deberes y obligaciones, que la posibilidad de exigirlo se dé también en su lengua originaria. Porque en México, como ustedes saben, tenemos eh, la plataforma eh, llamada Plataforma Nacional de Transparencia, pero es una vía en donde hoy hasta en un teléfono celular una persona que habla una lengua originaria puede ejercer sus derechos tanto de acceso a información pública como de protección de datos personales. Lo que no tenemos al 100% es esta posibilidad de interpretación simultánea para dar respuesta en la lengua originaria de que se trate. Y finalmente, yo quisiera mostrarles, en México identificamos que hay seis lenguas originarias que son las que mayormente se hablan, la más conocida es maya porque no es exclusiva de México, y entonces hicimos unas guías de protección de datos personales que hemos presentado en diversas entidades federativas que son donde mayormente se hablan lenguas originarias. También debo reconocer, y, y espero que abone en otros países, identificamos que este es un primer paso, tener guías en lenguas originarias en papel. Inclusive las hicimos, tratamos de hacer coloridas, llamativas, en lenguaje este, ciudadano, nada técnico. Pero también nos dijeron repetidamente eh, quienes hablan lenguas originarias que en, en seis de las que más se hablan en México, mayormente las lenguas originarias se escuchan y se hablan, se leen, pero se leen poco. Entonces, el reto también es identificar cuál es la necesidad real de estos pueblos originarios para que puedan ejercer de manera igualitaria y equitativa sus derechos, todos, incluyendo el de protección de datos personales. Y en México, el derecho de acceso a la información, que ha servido para pueblos originarios en la mejor toma de decisiones. La segunda etapa, por supuesto, que tenemos el reto es hablar, eh, no sé, serán audios, serán videos, pero ya no solamente papel. Gracias. Yes. Um, adding to the complexity and the, the challenges, and um, uh, I would say, um, uh, Alex, I appreciate that you having put this uh, item on the agenda because this is really, in a sense, just, I, I would say, I said scratching the surface, and it is. The, the issues are, are deeply complex and uh, span, span the globe. Um, we have a couple of minutes, uh, not, not a lot, but we have a couple of minutes for questions or comments from from some of you who may want to share your own experiences in your own jurisdictions. And I see uh, uh, a person, uh, Sean, in fact, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, my own country, Sean. Hello, yes, um, this has been a fascinating session. And I think not just only because of what we're learning about uh, the conception of privacy in indigenous communities, but um, thinking about how this approach to privacy can actually potentially represent a new paradigm for all of our uh, approaches to privacy. As you've mentioned, Michael, I mean, we're, we, you know, so much of the, the conference yesterday, we were hearing about the importance of uh, considering the sort of broader societal impacts of how data is, is used. And that this seems to be very much in line with what we're hearing in terms of how indigenous communities approach uh, the use of their data from a broader perspective. And I'm wondering if, the, if anyone on the panel has any thoughts about um, how we can apply the principles that we're hearing about in, in, f that are being used in indigenous communities in terms of data use and data, data sovereignty. Uh, are there broader lessons for us as regulators who are looking at statutes that are, uh, that are oriented entirely to individual uh, 
uses of and, and consent and things like that. Is there uh, are there are there lessons that we can draw as we uh, as we look at uh, um, sort of adapting to this this new world with technology, but also considering the people who have always been there around us, there are the indigenous uh, populations that that live with us. Thank you. Um, I would just quickly say in British Columbia, one of the things we now have to and are considering is how complaints are made to our office. So it's a very much individual base. There doesn't seem on the surface to be a vehicle for a collective complaints where communities can come to us as a group to make a complaint. But that is, when you think about the cultural issues that we've raised today, not only appropriate, but uh, uh, arguably perhaps illegally compelled at some stage given uh, the adoption of the declaration in, in British Columbia, but I would turn it over to other panelists if you have thoughts on that. Just very briefly, I, I think um, one, of the, one, of my, one of the responses I would have is to say to use whatever rights are within your own jurisdiction's legislation. I know in New Zealand we now have the possibility of collective complaints, representative complaints, and representative litigation is specifically allowed under our legislation. So if the legislation allows that, that, that gives a, a point of, uh, and, but it needs better education to educate people that these rights already exist. Um, so that's the first thing. But the second thing is, of course, that doesn't necessarily address the collective aspect. How, how does, if you're going to have groups of people coming together in data collectives, there's no legislation that currently allows that. And maybe that's the next stage for some kind of legislative uh, development. Yeah, so I think, uh, so in addition to um, group claims, uh, I think one of the things that the existing data protection um, frameworks do provide for us and are important for indigenous communities is provision specifically on sensitive personal data because most of uh, what we see for indigenous communities is that the desire to protect certain forms of data. Um, and so depending on their country that we're talking about, what the law provides on sensitive personal data can also be instrumental. And I'm also thinking about um, visibility, uh, because you mentioned about uh, tech, uh, modern technologies, and because at the end of the day, we also don't want technologies that are also exclusionary, so we need to also process their personal data. But it's also, we also have to cross the, uh, deal with the dilemma of do they really even want visibility? under certain forms of data. So it really depends on what the context is, but I think our data protection laws are a good starting point, um, having understood what features of indigenous communities we are dealing with. Sí. Yo quisiera reflexionar en el tema de que me parece que las personas de pueblos originarios que hablan una lengua originaria lo que tenemos que hacer es garantizar que tengan exactamente los mismos derechos en materia de protección de datos personales. El tema, por ejemplo, en México es cómo garantizar que una persona que habla y escribe español pueda ejercer su derecho a la protección de los datos personales exactamente igual que una persona que habla maya. Una de las limitantes es, por ejemplo, eh, nos han dicho reiteradamente para escribir del español a maya no es una traducción, es una interpretación, porque cada lengua originaria puede tener muchas más eh, especificaciones. Entonces, eh, es caro en México hacer una resolución de 100 cuartillas, por ejemplo, nos resulta muy caro porque lo hace un especialista en la materia y es certificado para asegurarnos que le estamos haciendo llegar, diciendo lo, lo que él va a entender. Entonces, eh, se requiere presupuesto. Hemos aprendido a hacer cuando hay que hacer esta interpretación del español a un maya, a un zapoteco, a un mixteco, en lugar de hacer resoluciones de 100 cuartillas, hacemos de 10, de 12 cuartillas, porque nos permite llegar a más. Pero creo que es un gran reto eh, poder en el momento saber qué está solicitando, de qué manera se le puede ayudar y si no, tener la capacidad institucional de resolver el, el poder dialogar. I don't know if we have time for one more comment or question. Uh, very uh, quickly, I'm cognizant of the, the time. Uh, you have no idea behind here how they give you flashing lights until you get up on the stage and see that. But if I could just invite, uh, oh, go okay. ahead. 
Um, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, this one's I guess not working. Um, my name is Rosemary Miners. Um, I've lived here in Bermuda for 18 years, but I am Canadian, um, um, more specifically from Manitoba, Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, where we just had a historical win by an Indigenous person as a premier. Um, so my question kind of stems around um, um, representation. So uh, I'm just from your perspective, um, how is representation changing um, within the landscape of all your, I guess, your countries in the sense of uh, having rights, uh, Indigenous people having a say in the legislation and um, as well their data privacy rights? And that's not a quick question. Right. <laughs> well, my 15 second answer would be uh, Premier Canoe. That's an incredible event in Manitoba. The other thing I would say is we are not doing a good enough job, certainly within our office, uh, in terms of uh, developing more representation of Indigenous people on staff. It's something that our, our team is not just looking at, but actively when we hire and think about these issues, we have to be uh, more inclusive in, uh, in the, the people we put in our office and are reaching out. I don't know if there's others that... Uh, Josefina. Uh, yo solamente insistir en que primero hay que asegurarnos que le estamos concientizando que tiene derechos fundamentales, que debe de conocerlos, que hay instituciones públicas, en el caso de México, en los tres niveles de gobierno, federal, estatal, municipal, para atenderlo y tener esa capacidad también tecnológica de responder lo más pronto posible a lo que los pueblos originarios requieran. So I do see now we are now over time. This is the beginning of a conversation. And uh, again, I'm very uh, grateful to the organizers uh, here in Bermuda to put this on the agenda to start this conversation. I want to thank Josefina, Yihan, and Mercy for her contributions to this panel. And if uh, you could all uh, thank them as well. Thank you.